Yo my people, today I went down to Birmingham City Centre to meet up with the content creator, broadcaster and comedian David Whiteley, aka Sideman, to find out about his journey and what he's up to now. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how I'm are Bex. you? I'm Bex. Hello Bex, I'm David, aka Sideman, aka Coleslaw, aka Garlic Bread. AKA, <laughs> All the not Coleslaw, not Garlic Bread, sure. You look wonderful. Do I? Of course you do. Thank you. You knew that already? Do you know what, yeah? I've said, do you know what I said? I'm not going to call you Sideman. Why? I'm not doing that. I'm Why? not calling you, I'm calling you Sideman. Why? That's mine. I'm not going to call you that. I'm going to call you David. Why? I don't, I don't have an ego, so you don't have to worry about that. No, You're no, not no. It's not about me. ego, but Sideman, that's mad still. So let's... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be calling you David. You can All call right. me Bex. And let's just be, All you right. know, on the first name basis. Okay. How are you today anyway? How I'm, are you feeling? You feeling I'm, good? I'm good. Shall we, shall we go get a coffee? Let's do it, man. Let's go. All right. Follow show me. Show me around. Show me around. You know I'm new. <laughs> <laughs> should we actually, where are we going? This way. All things are this way. The boring. Yes. Talk to me about Birmingham. Love it. It's my city. It helped me. Help shape who I am today. I know, and that's good. <laughs> I can feel you give me Birmingham vibes, man. Oh, uh, what, what does that mean? I don't know. You just give me Birmingham vibes. Like I can tell that you love your city. Yeah, you know always saying? have, always have. Because I always say that London is like a club, and Birmingham is like a house party. Okay. I'm so, for instance, in a club, you can't really communicate with people. It's purely dependent upon the vibes of the music to kind of like bring the evening along. Mm -hmm. Whereas with a house party, you see different people in different sections talking to people, interacting with them, getting to know them and kind of thing. And that's what Birmingham feels like to me. Like when I come to the city centre and I walk around in Birmingham city centre, I see people walking at a very slow place, like slow pace. Yeah, yeah. Like they're just enjoying the day. And I can sit and wonder what their lives are about. When I was in London, when I first came to London, mm -hmm. I was trying to walk at Birmingham pace and nearly got ran over by cars and pushed out of the way because everybody's just on the go. Fast pace, you get what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. And, and like, Birmingham people, they, they're not that gassed as well. So you, yeah. you gotta have you gotta have a personality because if you're expecting the trimmings and the trappings of your outward to gas them, it won't be enough. No, it's true actually. Did yeah. you always grow up here then, or did you? I, obviously, I was born in Jamaica, but I spent I spent a lot of my formative years here. So when you came from Jamaica, how old were you when you came? I, um, like eleven. Eleven. Yeah, but even it's though I left young. when I was eleven, by that time in Jamaica, you've, you've seen picked up a lot. A, a lot. Like, I, I felt like a big man by the time I left Jamaica. Like mm. a grown person, because I'd seen grown people things. What was life like in Jamaica? How were you living? Like, were you living with your parents um, or grandparents? I was living with my parents, but even by Jamaican standards, I would say that we were quite poor. Mm. So, where I lived in Jamaica, we had to go for water. Like, I visibly remember having to pick up a bucket, go and get water from the tank, and mm. then you're walking up the hill. I lived up a hill. Mm. You're walking up the hill with the tank, and then water's falling out of the bucket. <laughs> so by the time you make it, the top, you make it to the top, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've only got half of the bucket. That's crazy, yeah, that's yeah. crazy still. Have you ever been back? No, I haven't been you back. You haven't been back at all? Yeah, because I only got my passport back two or three years ago. So for the entirety, for the entirety of the time that I was in the UK, you I was no actually, um, I actually had no means of identification, oh. which means that I couldn't get an NI number. And because I couldn't get an NI number, I and like literally when I started working, is it at, that you or your your whole family? My fam whole family. So when I started working at the BBC, I think I got my NI number six months before that. If they had hollered me six months earlier, I would have had you to know. turn down the job. Oh my God. I was working at a, I was working at a Landis cash in hand. I shout out to that Landis every single day because if it, <laughs> now now if it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for them, you not wouldn't. only did the guy help me in terms of giving me a cash in hand job, mm. he also allowed me to chase my dreams. A lot of times I'd be editing at work, filming my videos at work and that's stuff like that. So I always got to shout him out. That's crazy, man. But coming over from JA, did you come straight to Birmingham? Was it a straight nah, process? No, 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 no. I was in London. I was in London for one night with yeah. the people that I was living. My parents were already living with there, but obviously now it's my parents and me and my brother. Yeah. They, my, Cause my parents came over before me and then me and my brother came over six months later. Okay. So then we moved to Ipswich, which was, a, I always have a special place in my heart for I Ipswich mm. because it was my first taste of England and I was experiencing all these new things. And I remember I went to a school in Ipswich and I, me and my brother was the only black people there. How long were you in Ipswich? Six months. Okay. And um, literally girls from the school was like touching man's skin saying they'd never seen a black guy before. Oh my days. Yeah, it was mad. And then like, there's so much about British culture that was so different to, to me. Like one of the girls invited me to her parents' house for dinner. Remember these times I'm, I'm like 11. So I've told my mum and my, I've asked my mum and my dad, can I go? They're like, what? You think you're going to go to a girl's house? For dinner, no, 
you're 11, do you get what I'm saying? So sadly, sorry Jade, I never, <laughs> <laughs> I never got to go. And then that's when I moved to, to Birmingham. Do you think that your experience in Ipswich, even like at school, shaped your thoughts about racism? Did you ever obviously no, because I No, because I loved it. I, I, I was not smart enough at the time to realise that I was being fetishised. So before you came to England, you didn't even realise before I, I had never seen a white person yeah, before I came so to the UK. No like I spent, and I think this has a lot to do with like inner confidence as well when it comes mm. to black people. I spent the first couple of years of my life only seeing black people walking around. Mm. Like we walk mm. around in a country right now where it's predominantly white, so you predominantly see white people. Yeah, yeah. I walked around in a country where it's predominantly black. Yeah, so you didn't I never saw a white person. I never saw snow That's until nice. I came to the UK. So when you then moved from Ipswich to Birmingham, yeah. how was that transition for you? Because obviously you had a great experience with mm. yeah. Ipswich. Yeah. Was it, was a, smooth? it was a massive culture shock in a multiple different ways, British life mm. in general. Because I remember when we rented a flat, I remember walking into the flat mm. and there was a washing machine in the flat. And I was like, What's I don't this? get it. <laughs> what is I had never even seen a washing machine before in oh my, my life. In the physical, in the flesh, mm. never went when I was in Jamaica. And I was like, in Britain, you can rent a house and a washing machine is just there. Madness to me. That's mad. That was mad to me. And I only started to feel the feelings of being poor again when I went to school and realised how much more other people yeah. had than me. But yeah. at first, I was like, yo, this really is the land of opportunity in yeah. a sense for me. What was it? Can you remember like the first moment in school where you realised, okay, cool, like, immediately we poor? I don't think I ever had a pair of Nike trainers while I was in secondary school. Okay. I don't think I ever wore a Nike, ever wore an Adidas trainers while I was in Fingy. Mm -mm. <laughs> so literally like the entire time when I was rocking shoe zone random trainers that don't have no name, mm. it was immediately apparent to me when I would see my friends in Nikes and Adidas. That's mad still. Yeah. When, when you said to your, did you ever say to your parents like, or did your parents ever say, you know, we don't have money? Or was it something that you just... They never had to say. I always, I always understood and I never put pressure on them. Like when I, Obviously, I was annoyed that I didn't have certain things, mm. but I never put pressure on my parents because I understood. Mm. Like, when I, when I was in Jamaica, there was times when, like, I just know where we came from, innit? Yeah. I just know where we came from, so I never put pressure on my parents for that. That's good, though. Nah, because I was the, I was the first son, I was the oldest. I felt, I, felt, I felt a responsibility to my family to not make them feel bad because at the end of the day, they helped take me out of the gutter. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And they instilled everything, everything within me for me to be able to achieve what I've achieved today. That's because true. I get my personality from my parents directly. Of course. I can see traits of mine in them. So I can't sit there and pretend like it, it's, it doesn't come from them. That's mad. When you were in Jamaica, did you want to leave? Because you said you, they I, took you out of the I gutter. Wanted, I wanted to leave because I realised that I couldn't do what I wanted to do in life there and that I'd probably die. It was a common That's thing crazy. that I'd probably die if I stayed in Jamaica because I was very opinionated. And in Jamaica, you will die. <laughs> like, yeah. it's not a, uh, It's not even a joke. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you will die. And I was, I was opinionated past the point of being afraid of death. Mm. That's why people don't understand how I when, I... when I see people on social media talk about me and think, oh yeah, he wouldn't say this in real life. I realise they don't understand. Mm. I chose death from early. Like I was in Jamaica God choosing. Forbid. I was, God forbid you chose death. From <laughs> like I mean, I chose I chose death before not being able to be free mm -mm -mm. to speak. I was always opinionated in Jamaica. And I it, like in Jamaica. It's just like there's so many things about Britain that people don't think about that I think about. I'd stand in a queue, right? I'd, I'd be over here and I'd stand yeah. in the queue, and no one is pushing past anybody, and I'd be like, that's mad. Why people no respect pushing? the queue. <laughs> like like somebody will see you in the queue, like oh sorry you were there, and they go to the back. In Jamaica, I, if a man if a man comes to the queue and you see him go in front of you, something has been communicated there subconsciously for you to understand. He knows something you don't know about him. <laughs> why he thinks you he can push back to the queue. Yet. You just need to let my man do what he's doing. That's crazy. That was the mindset in Jamaica, and I was like, I can't live under this mm. because I have to ask why. Mm. I have to ask why do you, why do you why are you not respecting my rights as a human? And you get what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. Like, I've always been like that. So I knew. I wouldn't be able to, I, I remember when I moved primary school and I went to this new primary school and it was in a tougher neighborhood mm. and the guys there asked me for my lunch money. At the time the lunch money was like $60 and I said no and they took me outside the school and they beat me around my face with like a Shit, ruler. Man. But Fuck. back in the day they used to have like the big board, like you know the, like the big rulers, like yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like a massive long ruler, yeah, mm. tough thing and they beat me with the ruler. Because the point for them was not for them to take the lunch money from me. The point for them was to break my mind. Mm -hmm. Unless they got it from me by me offering it to them, they didn't want to accept, they didn't want to take the money from me because yeah. they could have took it. So they beat me around the finger with it and they left me. 
And then when they walked away, I started laughing. And then they came back and they hit me again with the, with the ruler. And then they, they walked off again. And then I said, all right, cool. I won't laugh, I'll just smile. As I smiled, one of them turned around and saw me smiling at the exact moment that I smiled, came around and beat me with it again. And then they left and I said, that was, that's when I was broken now. Not to the point of giving them the money, but I said, I'm not gonna say anything. Mm. And then when they went to go back, leave the, first, the last time, they came back another time when I didn't do anything and hit me with the ruler again. That's yeah. massively traumatic though, not as a really. young child. I, I, I rate myself for that. <laughs> when I, I think back on that fondly. That's mad. Because nah. I think back on that and I say, you know what, yeah, even though I, I didn't maintain full, I could have laughed every single time. Yeah. The beating did subdue me eventually, but I like the fact that I stood my ground even for a little bit. Do you think that being that kind of outspoken person, you know, you knew from early you wanted to do a career where you could be outspoken. Do you, yeah. know, do you think it was intentional? Did you know exactly what or? At first I wanted to be a journalist. Okay. But then I realised that a journalist is asking other people's questions and I want to be the one to talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have opinions, I have views that I want to share. You and that's when I kind of changed it. And um, <clears throat> nobody would know this guy, but I was inspired by a YouTube, <clears throat> a YouTube comedian. He's Korean, um, and his name's David So. If you want to go check him out, mm -hmm. and I used to, I used to watch his YouTube videos, and he just took, he took up a camera, pointed it at his face, and just spoke about the things that he cared about. Mm -hmm. But he delivered them in ways that were intriguing, because everybody wants to start a podcast, everybody wants to start a YouTube show, everybody wants to start a thingy because they think they have points. It's not about whether you have points. Yeah, yeah. Everybody has points. Half the advice in the world is mad generic. You know what I mean? It's stuff that anybody would say. Yeah, yeah. But can you deliver your point in a way that's engaging and interesting to the audience? Did your parents find you annoying when you was younger? No, because my parents are smart. They understand. My parents can see right through me. Did like, they, my did they parents... never warn you about being outspoken? Like, they just, yeah, yeah, like... yeah, but my parents... Yeah, but I, come from a, I come from a Christian background of people that are very, strong, are very strongly mm. Christian, so they're bold. My parents are bold people. They're bold about their faith. They're bold about the things that they care about. So when I go back home and that, people always ask me, your parents must be so proud. And it's not that they're not proud, but when I go back home, my parents' first question isn't how much money did you make? Or how much did you do this? Or what next advert did you do? The question is, are you, are you good inside? Yeah. Are you still you? Have you kept your morals? Have you kept your principles? Have you maintained who you are as a person? Mm. So there's no, there's no, you know, I'm pulling the wool over their eyes. Yeah. Uh, they know, they, yeah, they see me for who I really am. So talk to me a little bit about your parents, like, how did they feel about your outspoken nature? How did they feel about your choice in career? How was your relationship with them growing up? Um, my relationship with my parents is very strong, mm. but they were mad worried about my career choice mm. and the places that it would lead me. And it's not always been great places that it's led me. I wouldn't say that my career has been squeaky clean as it pertains to me morally. Like I don't feel like all my decisions that I've made over the years or everything that I've ever said. So when did you first decide you know, this is actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a creative, I'm going to do... I always knew that. Because you said you that. wanted to be a journalist. So how did you progress from... I, I saw a journalist as a creative though. To be honest, when I wanted to be okay, a journalist, I, I wasn't sure what a journalist was. Mm. That's why when I'm saying, when I realised a journalist is more asking other people questions. And what age was that, that, do you reckon? Maybe like 10. Okay, so quite young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I always knew that I wanted a career in the media mm. because, the, because media always fascinated me mm. and I always felt it as a way to reach a lot of people and I always realised how much the media controls the masses. Mm. So I thought, okay, this is, this is a good career and, and it's lucrative mm. and, and how much a career makes is a big part of it to me. So when you presented that to your parents, especially at that young age, and I can imagine Jamaican parents and you say, you know, look, listen, I want to be a creative, I want to work in media, I want to be a journalist. How did they react? Um, not too, not too negatively. Just warning me because my parents are wise. Mm. They're not going to push away their child by being too rejective of their, of their ch life choice. Because yeah. a lot of parents do that. Mm. I would say that my parents were smarter than that, mm. and I feel like they've just helped me steer. What did they say to you? Can you remember? Um, what did they say to me? They've just said, you know, you got to be careful. Like David, no, <laughs> no, no, nah, no, nah, nah, never, no, never, no. They were just like, you have to be careful. Yeah. And can, can you do this and maintain your Christianity? Can you do this and maintain your faith? Have you managed to do it and maintain your Christianity? Yeah, I would. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm still strongly a Christian. I still maintain that 100. percent I'll die before I'm not a Christian. Amen. Yeah, that's Amen. that's a different that's a different level of a thing for me. That's deeper than all of this for me. Yeah. How important is your faith to you in terms of what you do now and where you're going? It's the most important thing. And as I'm getting older, it's starting to matter and matter way more than any of this other stuff. Like mm -hmm. it's starting to really matter more and more and more mm -hmm. because I'm realizing how much it's just important to just stay with God in this mad world. Mm -hmm. Like I look at people and I, and, and I see through people mm -hmm. and I see that most of this world is depressed, most of this world is anxious, most of this world is, is broken mm -hmm. in so many different ways and I don't want to be a part of that. And the thing that has kept me grounded is, is, my, is my faith. 
is my relationship with God because it, al it allows me to be informed about who I am in this system. It allows Amen. me to find purpose in my pain. So yeah, it's important. I think as well, probably your parents seeing you have such a strong faith and strong spirituality moving through your career, that probably gave them a lot of assurance. Do you feel? Ah! My yeah. parents' faith is so strong that Mine is like, it's alright. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm so working. when you was going through the nah, they, no, they do regard it. They do regard that I, because obviously, as I said, there's so much to be tempted by. There's so much to say, you know what? Let me stop thinking about God. Let me stop thinking about Christianity. Let me leave that. But even when I was in London, I lived in London for three years. Worked when I was working at the BBC and doing different, different things. I came back to Birmingham to church every Sunday. That's amazing. Yeah, I took the it? train every Sunday and came back to church in Birmingham. That's dedication. Yeah, so, and, and, and as I said, to you, no matter where, I would never move too far away from my church. Mm. Yeah. That's incredible though. I think it's important, especially like in this day and age, sometimes you don't really find that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And even as you go through your career, with the ups and downs, what would you actually say is probably like the most turbulent time of your career? Start to finish from your, your early when you've actually embarked on the journey? Probably, it would probably never be what people think because like, for instance, like obviously, some people have very disparaging opinions on me now. Mm -hmm. And like, there's a lot of a polar, there's a polarized audience when it comes to me now, but I don't find that turbulent at all. I would say the most turbulent point for me at my career is the transition from just being a comedian, you know, whether stand up or online, to being a broadcaster at the BBC. Mm -hmm. That was the toughest thing, trying to keep your personality while working a board and a system, mm -hmm. and then be going into a system, going into, a place with you know producers assistant producers i had to humble myself in a lot of different ways i had to play the game in a lot of different ways and i would say that was a turbulent time for me because it's like oh my god i finally gotten my big break mm. so much hang it was it was the transition period mm. it was the make or break period so much hangs on this this is not just me now being that funny guy from brom this is serious this business. is me now being ingrained in the industry depending on how i move at this point so you feel like that was more tough than your early career where it's like I'm starting out I'm trying to discover what no, I'm doing no because at that point if you fail it's just like it didn't it's like no one even knows it's like it's like it's like if you fail it's like oh yeah I tried it didn't work out this is that would have been I tried it could have worked out and I flapped it mm -mm -mm. so I would say that would have been the most turbulent time so give me a little time because what age would you say you were starting to become this comedian you were well I was rapping at first I was I was doing rapping at first but then I became uncomfortable with the messages that I would have to put to perpetuate as a rapper but why? that I felt like anyway because obviously I was n I've never claimed to be a super duper roadman when was man. you rapping what age um just from school like time. in school okay yeah. cool. I've never ever claimed to be a super roadman but even for the things that I did do mm -mm -mm. I didn't want to rap about the things that I was doing mm -hmm. do you get what I'm saying I didn't want to because it, for me it was just like I don't even agree with the stuff I'm doing yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It, 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 it's messed up I don't rate it I don't want to perpetuate it in songs do you get what I'm saying and yeah. I felt like I felt like back then that was the only rap that was cutting through and I kind of still feel like that even to this day. Yeah, so that's kind of why I gave up rap. And I said, well, what else can I do in the entertainment industry that I feel more comfortable with? And I was like, well, there's nothing wrong with making people laugh. Mm -mm -mm. So I started making people laugh. So you was rapping in school, it wasn't for you. And where was the point where you're like, I'm going to stop rapping now. I'm going to leave the rapping, I'm going to go into being a comedian. This yeah. is going to make people laugh. Like literally just right after college. Right after college. Because like literally, I was doing music that I didn't even want to put out because I didn't want my parents to hear it. <laughs> yeah, like I was constantly yeah, thinking, that's yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah like, 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 I don't know how these men do it. Do you think if you kept doing music, the relationship with your parents would have broke down? If no, they heard some of the stuff no, these No, they're my parents, innit? Yeah. Yeah, they're your parents, they're going to love they're you no matter what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. True, I don't true. think it would have broken down. So what was you doing in college? What did you study? Um, I studied media and business. Did you go on to uni? No. You my parents, you see, that's where there was some disparity between me and my parents. Because they wanted me to go to university. But I felt like, you know what? education is not doing it for me anymore i'm learning at too slow a pace and i feel like i'm learning stuff that's all it felt it feels like red tape it feels like i'm learning stuff that isn't vital that isn't important that isn't necessary to the process of what i want to do and i need to just cut out the middleman and just get stuff done and my parents always were like david you've got the academic ability to be a doctor to be do you get what i'm saying but like yeah. that's only because of just typical old jamaican perceptions of success trust me you go and be a doctor you go and be <laughs> yeah, a dentist, dentist you get, yeah. I go and be a lawyer do you get what i'm saying yeah, yeah. And they always wanted me to be a lawyer because they said i could talk myself out of anything <laughs> but um it's true. i just i just knew that uni weren't for me we literally was having this conversation every day the other day because my parents even though they they, they they wanted me to go uni mm. they were 100 percent against me not going but my auntie my auntie was almost, it was almost like she was like slightly disappointed in my parents mm. for not pushing us further towards uni. Really? But then just the other day she was just like, you know what? 
it made sense. You, 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 you made sense. It made sense. You yeah. had a vision, man. So when you was leaving college, which is why I, I, I kind of don't want my kids to. I rather don't want to put my kids in school. The only reason why I probably put my kids in school is for the social element. You don't want to put your kids in school at all. At all. I, I think. I yeah, but think why? I could, what, I what's think, your main reason? I think I could teach my kids in two days of the week more important stuff. That, why is tax, council tax? Mortgages, nothing. I never heard the word mortgage once in a school lesson. Nah, never heard the word tax. Never heard the word council tax. Never heard the. Never heard residual earning. Never heard passive income. Never heard anything that would actually help you in actual life. So I had to, you had to come and learn what tax was when you got a job. Yeah. That's madness to me. Not even in college did I ever hear these terms. So when did you and first did get business? your first job? When I got my first job, I got my first. I've only had one job, and that was at Landis. And you got that after college. And I got that. Yeah, sometime after college. Yeah. Did you have a plan of how you was gonna make money? Or was you just I, making I, skits? Thinking? I knew how I was going to make money because of um, Man Them on the Wall. Okay. Man Them on the Wall was so the that blue, was your blueprint. They were, they was my blueprint. They was my blueprint. All you have to do, and I said to myself, watch, in a couple years, the way the industry is going to work, it will be clout over talent. Okay. I already know I have talent, mm. but if I don't have clout, it won't matter. Mm. I, saw, I saw it coming. Mm. And now we've seen people like Love Islanders, people that just got engagement. I've seen Love Islanders do Broadway. Do West End. A lot of things. Do th do TV, do movie, do things that they were like reality TV would have been considered. Oh yeah, you're blocked from this stuff because yeah. you're not serious. No, if you have enough clout, you can do anything. If you have enough clout, somebody will call you. You, you see films where they slap Cardi B in there randomly, or they slap a rapper in there randomly. Mm. Why? Because of clout. Mm. Not because they believe that Cardi B's acting ability was going to be so or inspiring. No, clout clout will put you through doors. Remember, when I did radio, right? I had no experience in radio whatsoever. I had never done a radio show, mm. and went from never doing a radio show to Charlie Slough following me to do radio to doing BBC Radio One and One Extra. Not just one extra. I was on Radio One and One Extra mm. Monday to Thursdays every single week, having never had any experience in radio. White clout. How did you build up that clout? How did you first decide, I'm going to jump on social media, yeah. I'm going to build this clout? Um, what was the plan behind it? Understanding marketing. Marketing is very simple. Marketing is you putting yourself in front of an audience that you either don't have or an audience that is, or somebody with a platform with a bigger audience. Mm. That's what a billboard is. When somebody puts up their advert on a billboard or on TV, they're just marketing themselves to different or greater audiences. Mm -hmm. So I understood that model, which is what I continue to do. So I hollered, I'm just bait. Okay. I'm just bait. I had like 200,000 followers at the time. I didn't even have an Instagram. I started putting my money where my mouth was mm. and I asked I'm just bait to um, share my videos, obviously paying him. Mm. I, then I couldn't sustain that financially because I was working at Landis. So wait, let me get this right. Before you was even posting on your own social no, media. No, I was posting on YouTube. You was posting on you yeah, YouTube? Yeah, but I didn't have an Instagram. But because I got him to post on my Instagram, I said, ah, might as well make an Instagram. And that's what made you get an Instagram. And, that's what, and so my Instagram account started off with about 5,000 followers because he shared one of my videos and people started following me immediately. So you just literally hit him up and was like, I've got a proposal for you. This is what I'm He was do. doing promotions anyway. You gotta put your money in your mouth with the minute and you have to promote what you have to promote wisely. Mm. I can promote with I'm just bait because his audience was looking for the content I was giving. Mm. His audience was looking for comedy. Like sometimes when somebody like wants to promote their business on some pages, it's like, why would you promote there? That page doesn't even cater to an audience that looks for that stuff. You can have you can have the same person treat different content differently on different pages. Mm. Right? So it's like, let's say I'm let's say let's say I'm just bait posts a cake business. Even the comments are like Nobody care about no cakes. <laughs> but then that same person could see a cake page that they follow post a cake thing. Mm. And then they engage with it because that's what they expected from there. Mm. So I'm just Bates audience expected comedy. Mm. So it was easy for me to get an audience from there. How was the reception from his page? From it the was audience? only people telling me about my accent. Really? Literally? For the first year or so of my comedy, my accent was more the topic of conversation than the actual content. Mm. How did I, you take that on? Um, there were nights I spent in my room thinking, shall I learn the, shall I learn the London accent? <laughs> there were nights, there was nights I contemplated it. I tried and failed. <laughs> I tried to gain the London accent and I failed. And I, um, I'm happy now though. Yeah, because I don't, that? Because I don't even think people, I think a lot of people don't even see my voice as synonymous with the Birmingham accent. That's just Sideman's voice. <laughs> so you've adopted, it's, it's your own thing basically. Yeah, it's, it's just become my voice. your style. It's just my voice, isn't it? Yeah. So going from being on I'm Just Bait and then getting your own Instagram yeah. following, because it's different when you're putting the videos out to his followers. And Hackney's got... Finest as well. I got a shout out. And Hackney's Hackney, Finest. Hackney's Finest, they helped me at the time as well. And GRM, all these pages I was putting it on. But what I did was, when I couldn't sustain it financially, I made a deal with I'm Just Bait. What was the deal? I said to him, if I put the name, if I put your Instagram name on all of my videos, 
would you share them for free? It's comedy anyway. Yeah. So it's what you would have posted anyway, yeah. right? But with your name on it, anywhere these those goals, it promotes you. Yeah. He agreed. We did that for about a year. That skyrocket, skyrocket. I got to about 100k followers on Instagram doing that. So how many videos roughly was he putting out? So our week? deal was three a week. Three a week. He didn't post three a week every week. There okay. were some weeks he posted one. There were some weeks he posted none. I never disrespected that man. Never got at him with any energy because at the point, at, at that point. Regardless, he's doing me a massive favor either by posting one. Mm -hmm. People burn bridges sometimes in this industry because they expect things from people, but yeah, I'm just waiting in my, in my family, my mama and my daddy, and he don't owe me nothing. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So I, nev I maintain that relationship and shout out to him because he's a big part of why I'm here, You're today. here today. Yeah, man. And it must be hard now, like, when you look at people that are trying to come up at the time when you were doing what you were doing, do you feel like it was a saturated industry? Do you feel like people had the edge that you have? Which is business mind or do you feel like that's no. what set you apart? I never felt, never felt like it was oversaturated. Um, I don't spend my time thinking about what other people are doing to slow me down. Okay. Many times, if I did, if I did that, I'd let it cripple me. Let's say somebody like Young Philly that started at a similar time that, than I am. He's way bigger than I am now. Mm. You get what I'm saying? But what am I going to do? Stop and think about that all day. No, of course. If yeah, I yeah. stop and think about that all day, I wouldn't have bought, bought a house. <laughs> just, you know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't make sense. Mm. It doesn't make sense. Okay, he's bigger than you, but do your thing, <laughs> do, you know do your thing. You know what I'm saying? No one's ever gotten bigger by thinking about another man being bigger. No, of course. That's crazy still. Yeah. But and, and when you're saying to I'm just wait, look, listen, I ain't got no more money, da, 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 you got to 100k views, but yeah. how was you earning money? Was you still working in Londis? Or was oh, you no, no. So, yeah, I was working in Londis and eventually I quit Londis and I was doing promo. Just doing promo, okay. promo for local artists. I do, I'd, but I did it different. I did adverts. To this day, I barely see anybody do that. Okay. So I, when somebody asks me for promo, I don't just post up their their music video, post up their thingy. I'm like, yo, I do adverts. If you, if I don't, I want to do an advert that still maintains engagement on my page. So when you pay me, I'm going to make an advert around your song or around your local, like the local Big Johns would call me for an advert, the local barber shop, and I was making money by that because like, they'd give me a hundred or two hundred or three hundred depending on how much the advert was. I was taking this money and reinvesting it, buying cameras, yeah. renting out a studio and having a place to do my business. And I was doing adverts about me doing adverts. That's mad. So how long b before doing these adverts was you making videos? So you was making the videos for about a uh, year, Maybe like a years, year, two years. Yeah. And then you started making the adverts. Yeah, yeah, and then started doing adverts. So when I was doing adverts, that immediately set me in a different place. Mm. Immediately. Because when companies holler me, when companies holler a lot of influencers, mm. they holler them to do something that they're telling them to do. Mm -mm -mm. Companies have to pay me a different level of bread because they're hollering me to create the concept from dirt. Mm. Write it, film it, How did direct you do it, cast it, you do, everything. So you do everything yourself? I do all of it. I do all of it and with, with my team, at first I would do it, at first I would literally run around the back of the camera, press record and run around the front. But then I, I, after a while I was able to afford the team. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? And maybe even that first, not even afford, just asking people for favours, asking people to help Where me. did you learn the skills to use a camera, to write? College from media. Oh, so And plus, as I said, you watch a YouTube tutorial, you'll get it. I soak mm -hmm. up information quite quickly. That's so yeah, I, do, I was doing that. But what was the first, what was the first advert that you did that you got paid for? Can you remember? I can't even remember. It would have been somebody's music video, somebody's app that they started. When I say bare local business, yeah, it was yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like, how you advertise and how you promote on your page and what you show on your page would determine who approaches you for an advert. Mm. I'm telling you, business, insurance companies, all kinds of different random things. People that wouldn't usually approach our community for adverts was approaching me for adverts. Mm. So I'm saying, like shops, like stores and that would be approaching me for adverts and I'd be doing little adverts for like different shops and stuff like that and depending on the shop and how established it was I could like hike up the budget yeah, yeah, so yeah. if even even if it's like 200 300 at a time because you're doing it uh, doing it so often I was able to make a livable wage mm. so that's when I left Landis and then started doing this full time mm. and then some guy gave me the advice of a lifetime go on and spill the tea it seems peak but I don't even know this guy's name's Vaughn and I'm just at the studio one time yeah I'm at my studio one time and I felt like I'd hit a ceiling. I was like, how do I take this to the next level? Mm. And he's like, oh, you gotta leave Birmingham? And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, oh, you gotta leave, bro. Had you left at that point no, before? No, no, I was in Birmingham doing my thing. Uh, but he's like, you've got, he was like, who has you ever seen get big from Brom? Lady Leisha left. He even went back to Lenny Henry and said everybody left. I was like, what? And that's when I changed my mindset completely. Mm. Unfortunately for Birmingham, even at this point, Birmingham is not the media hub of the country, London is. Yeah. I started collaborating with London. I couldn't believe it. I was messaging London artists to do videos and collaborating, and they were actually agreeing to do it. Who, Message, like who? I'll tell you all. First of all, the first artist, tell me, tell me. the first London artist I ever did a video with set the pace and the tone for every single other one. Gigs. That's big. 
Giggs. Giggs was the first London artist I ever did a video with. So literally, Man. okay, so when I first started doing Road Band, the series, yeah, I said to myself, you're about to start something. Anytime somebody starts a venture, something happens to discourage them. When that thing comes, don't let it bother you. Mm. I bought this nice, shiny new lens for my camera, put it on my camera, left it. See, I bought the nice lens, bought the dead tripod. Tripod dropped, lens broke immediately. Wow. I stood there and I looked at that lens and I said, oh, this was it. Put the dead lens on and started filming. You see that same thing that I filmed here, mm. Like a year and a half later, I posted a clip from it on Instagram. All it was was a video of me and a guy walking around in a circle acting like we're going to fight, but never fighting. <laughs> Giggs posted it on his Instagram, didn't even at me. But as I said, I don't burn bridges, mm. right? I commented and I was like, thank you so much for posting this, bro. Giggs immediately followed me. I went in Giggs DM and I said, bro, if you do a video with me, that would change my life. Now, I had to think of a way to get Giggs to do a video with me without leaving his yard. That's when I came up with the phone call idea. So the phone call idea is, I do a video with a London artist, right? He's in London. He can do, I, this is how I'd message them. You can do this from the comfort of your own home. All you have to do is pretend to be on one phone and record yourself with another. We're going to pretend to have a conversation. Me and Giggs have a conversation where, he, where I, me and him are having a conversation about him taking my girl. Hey, I heard you done something with my girl, blood. Yeah, hey, I kind of did still. Hello? How do I get Samantha to stop cheating on me, fam? What are you doing that I'm not doing? So we do that video. I couldn't believe it. He agreed. He agreed to it. He was like, "Yeah, cool, I'll do it." I said to him, "Bro, you changed my life by doing this." Like, okay. He was like, <laughs> I remember he couldn't understand the <laughs> idea. Okay. He couldn't understand the idea. He sent me his number. He was like, "Call me," and I was like, "He's well, I'm from Brom, you know. <laughs> Obviously, you like a Londoner, so you don't understand like." Giggs is a lot, I know Giggs is big to Londoners, but to yeah. me, it's like a not a real person. Mm. Do you get, he might as well be from America. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? So. I'm speaking to Hollow on the phone and he's like, yeah, explain the idea to me. <laughs> so I explained the idea to him and I run it by him and he's like, cool. He had it over to me within like 15 minutes. Yeah, do you know. <laughs> I posted the video. Everybody's like, oh, you done the video with Giggs? I was like, That's mad. oh, clout. I then used the Giggs video, message Crepton and Conan. He's like, look, I did a video with Giggs. Would you like be willing to do one with me as well? Mm. Got my video with Crepton Conan. Then I used the video of Giggs and the video of Crepton Conan and sent it to another, sent it to Chip. Chip, would you be willing to do a video with me? Look, I already did one of Giggs and Crepton Conan. Chip does a video with me. Then I start doing, every time I catalog a new one, I add them to the CV and it to propels, use it to yeah. get more of them. I started doing videos with, and every single time I did it, every blog page would post me because I'm doing a video with the biggest rappers of the time. Mm -mm. My followers started growing up. That's why I went from 100K to 200K. That's crazy. Literally by doing that method, because I'm now using, I'm using, I'm using, what, this is what people don't do. This is why sometimes people don't post their wins on social media because it gets less engagement. No, it's a, your Instagram is your CV. Mm. You're telling people what you've done because it only takes one person of influence to see that and say, you know what? We want to book him for a job. Yeah. And it put me in a completely different light. And when I did the video with Giggs, it right? changed everything. That's when Charlie Slough started following me. Okay. And I asked him to do a video with me like how I asked all these other rappers and people to do a video with me. Mm. And he said he would do it then blanked me for a year and a half. Mad. I'm messaging him like, bro, just a reminder about the video. That's how it was at first. It got way more pathetic. Then I was like, bro, I told all my friends about it and that now I look wild to the man name. That's oh how sad he got. God. Blanking me. Then one day he just messaged me that come to London. When I went to London, he said, you're doing this radio show with me Monday to Thursday on BBC One and BBC One Extra. Just like that? Just like that. That's insane. Just like that. So when you got to London and you and you, Charlie Soft offered you this job opportunity, yeah. how did you feel? Gassed. What? He was gassed there. Gassed because he's looking at me. He's looking at me and he's telling me the real. He's like, yo, mortgage money, you know. Mm -mm. That's why he looked at me and he said, he's like, yo, mortgage money. That's crazy. I didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> I ain't asking him how much. You know, he's like, yo, mortgage money. I'm yeah, I'm down. Mortgage money. And I was like, I'm in. And yeah, life changing. That's, and you started, when did you start radio after you had that conversation? So uh, like, a, like a week after. So you literally just had a week? Like a week after, like a week after. And eventually I had to move to London because I was, I was, saying, it was Monday to Thursday. Wow. So I was coming up here every day. So I had to move to London, ended up moving to London. That's crazy. And that was the beginning, really, yeah. of the career. Yeah, that so, was the beginning of it, taking it to another level. How did you find radio? Radio, I love the radio. Mm. I love the experience of radio. And the only reason why I haven't gone back to radio is because I've had a taste of freedom. Okay. It's saying exactly what you want to say. And in controlling your narrative and, and talking only about the things that you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Because with any corporate job, you're going to have to talk about things you don't want to. Mm. Talk about, but with, with, with podcasting, I feel a bit more free. So like with the ZZ podcast and things like that. Yeah. So when you was doing radio, you're moving from big being 
a comedian who makes videos, does adverts yeah. into this radio yeah. life. It's a change of career. What did you do to prepare yourself? Like, did you have to do any research or did you just go in as yourself? I just, I just went in and I, my, my preparation was humility. I, when I went into BBC Radio, everybody was my boss. The assistant producer, the producer, the runner. I never acted stush to everybody because obviously there's a culture in there yeah. where, oh, that's the radio personality. You lot are the producers that assist them. You help them. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm. But I never had that vibe. What was that like though? Everybody was my boss. Because I understand people don't teach you things if you don't behave teachable. If you behave like a boss that knows everything already, why are they going to teach you? Of course. So I walked in there and I let everybody talk to me like a ch I was a child in that building. I was like everybody's son. Everybody, I, I dare anybody to tell me differently there. Mm -hmm. Everybody was like my mom and my dad there. Mm -hmm. Anybody, I let anybody teach me, anybody tell me. I went in there and I acted like my most childish version of myself. Yeah. I gave them a child to, to nurture and to grow <laughs> and they taught me. I'd be like, oh, so how do you do this and blah, 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 blah. I never, I, 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 I dumbed myself down. So when you... That's why when I was left, they was all shocked because they don't know me. Really? Nah, nah, nah. They, 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 they had no idea who I am. That's Most people don't know who I am. In the sense that I got way more gut than you would think. No, I can tell from what you're saying, to be honest yeah. with you. And even they, being they, in they, that radio... It's more apparent now, mm. but I, can, I knew that was a culture shock for them at the time because they that's not the version it. of me that they received. No. Not no. at all. When you made that move into radio, did you feel that your position in the industry had changed, your clout level Massively. had gone up. I was in the industry, I wasn't even in the industry before, now I was in the industry. Were people hitting you up? Yeah, yeah it, it opened a whole new door of opportunity and it, and, it, and it marketed me as a presenter. Yeah. A presenter is a way more powerful position. Yes. Because a presenter does all kinds of things, hosting, interviews, like, bruv. Like I, do, I do, I do, before, other than my ZZ podcast, I do interviews for Amazon. Mm -hmm. Like just yeah. interviewing like movie stars and that. Mm. I'm the interviewer. Mm. They pay me to interview people. Horrifying <laughs> bread. Like to meet people, I would have always. They paid me to interview Professor X. You know the guy that plays <laughs> I know Professor X? Talking. Like, they paid me to interview him. How did that feel? I'm, I'm a Marvel fan. Ins I know. Insane. I would have done that for. F I wouldn't have done that for free, Amazon. You have to pay me. <laughs> nah, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It was That's, amazing. Out of everyone that hollered you when you was doing radio, who do you think you was most surprised by or shocked by that actually was like okay cool they're reaching out to me um i think maybe when i did the lucas aid deal mm. for um love island mm. I, I stuck to lucas aid in landis for two years and now i'm working with lucas aid that's mad i've worked with big bra like yeah. like something to say like sometimes like sometimes you have to explain to people because mm. they be thinking you're just in the gutter like, like sometimes we're, when we're in the in the gutter just arguing, people don't understand. I'm not even there. Yeah. I don't even make my money from no, there. No. Like when I, t when I think about brands that I've worked with, gum, um, 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 what the gum called? Oh, what they called? Extra chewing gum. Yeah. Lucasaid, Hotels.com, Amazon, wild, wild stuff, mm. wild mainstream stuff. Do you get what I'm saying? And it's because I've diversified my content mm -mm. because I was willing to d review Love Island mm -hmm. and other people weren't. Other people like, why is my man watching Love Island for? Yeah. Why weren't watching this for? Like. But man can't come for chat with for me because I think differently. No, I, I'm, I unplug the matrix. You can't chat to me. I, I, I watch Love Island where 50% of the cast is, is gal in bikinis and you watch football where 90% of the people are men kicking around balls <laughs> for 90 minutes. Yeah, it's true about diversifying your audience. I think even when I see you doing things with ZZ and yeah. coming into that side of things, yeah. you know, that opened me up to you more. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? So even that relationship, how did you orchestrate it? Was it captivating? ZZ. From the second I saw ZZ on social media, I was like, yeah. This is, she has what I wanted. Since being working with ZZ, I feel like I've been more seen as a cultural commentator than ever before. Mm. And I felt like she had that title. And I feel like if you don't understand what that girl is going to become, you, you, you're blind. You don't see it. Yeah. You're blind, you don't see it. And with me, understanding what somebody will become doesn't mean I agree with everything that they say, mm. but I can understand the power that they wield. Mm. I can understand that ZZ will do what other people won't because she has tenacity mm. and tenacity counts. ZZ will say the thing that will have her, have her being, if ZZ searches her name on any given day on Twitter, it's abuse. Mm. Not everybody can tackle that. Yeah. Not everybody can handle that. People will never understand the strength of that girl. Mm -hmm. to, to pick up the gauntlet every single time and go out there and say something wild again when she will receive that much pushback. Mm. It, it's not for every it's not for the it's not for the faint of heart. 
in my opinion, she's the UK Oprah and that will be proven even more through time. Mm. And it takes tenacity to do that. And the second I saw her do that, I was like, because people used to tell me they can't be a UK Charlemagne. Mm. That to, she, to me, is the UK Charlemagne. Mm. She's, she's saying exactly what, what she thinks. Yeah. Right. But how did you reach out to her? What did you suggest? I, I, I reached out to ZZ in the only way I thought would work. When I'm reaching out to somebody, I, I, I think in my mind, what will work? What will get me the yes out of this conversation? Money. Money. Sure. I was not speaking to ZZ Mills without talking money. ZZ can talk to anybody. ZZ can sit across from anybody and talk to any other presenter, brother, mm. would, would sit across from ZZ and talk to him. Why is she going to sit across from me? Who am I? See, some people have an over inflated view of themselves. Yeah, yeah. I knew ZZ ain't gonna just sit in front of me just for free and for bands. Mm. ZZ's not gonna feel like I'm going to bring so much to her table. So I brought something to her table and I paid her well. I'm not gonna say how much I paid her, but no, I no, paid no, her, we'll ask, I paid her ask. good for four days of work yeah. because we only do the podcast once a week. I, I said to myself, if I do this podcast with ZZ, that's going to put us in a different space. Mm. That's going to put me and her in the same kind of conversation. Mm. Next thing you know, we're doing the Amazon podcast where we're being paid. We're being paid a week for the Amazon podcast, what I was paying her a month for us doing it together, yeah. each. That's crazy. Yeah. And how did she react to you offering her? Did, was she surprised? Like, oh, right, you actually want to pay she me? Just, she just she understood just like, that, okay, this guy's not, she values. this guy respects my my opposition. He, he respects my engagement. He respects what I bring to the table. Mm. And I've never fronted on her with that. You don't need to, no. why? If you believe in yourself and know who you are, you don't need to front on somebody. You can, you can, you can celebrate them. 100%. Z like, me shining light on ZZ don't make me feel any more, in, any, any more dim. If anything, it kind of like brings you up. Do yeah. you know what I'm saying? She brought, it compliments she you nicely. The girl brought me up. Yeah, 100%. The did girl you, brought me did up. Did you have a plan of what you intended to do with her when you reached out? I literally said to her, Just if we do, do this together, somebody's going to holler us. I don't know who it is, but, but somebody's going to holler us. I.e. Amazon. How long was you doing you guys' podcast before? Not even that long. I, I don't, don't think, even think I a year. Maybe like six months. Mm. Maybe like six months. Enter Amazon. That's crazy. Shout out to Delisa every time, but yeah. And they just, they, they came out of the blue. They came like, we want you to. We've seen it work. We see it work. So let's just have you two. That's wild. I could have let her start talking with other brothers and then let, <laughs> then let, then let, let them see them that work. That's crazy. No? So now do you see yourself as a cultural commentator as well? Yeah, yeah and I feel like people see me as that as such and I I'm did, described yeah. as such on social media and ZZ helped to, 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 to make me do that. I feel like you have a lot of titles, do you know what I mean? I feel like along the way yeah, you've got comedian, a Comedian, presenter, broadcaster, sex symbol, yeah. There's a lot that comes with it. There's a lot of that. <laughs> How do you manage it all? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I don't manage it all. Um, day to day, day to day, innit? It depends on which hat I'm wearing. Do you ever feel like you're, you're spreading day? yourself thin? It's no. a lot, man. It's a lot. You know what it is, yeah? I, if, if I can say one of my God-given talents is, is that I just don't run out of bars. <laughs> if you, if, whether you rate the bars or not, I don't run out of bars. I don't, when a, when a new brand comes to me and says, listen, we want you to, we want you to promote cereal. <laughs> I, I'm not sitting there for two, three days stuck thinking, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? Ideas just come to me quickly. And if, if you're a creator out there and you want ideas to come to you quickly, consume media, mm. consume as much different varying types of media. Because when I'm thinking of ideas, I'm pulling from anime mm. that I've watched, mm. TV series, comic books. I'm pulling from so many different things. You don't even know where these eyes are coming. So when I, when I finally come up with a video, mm. it's a melting pot of all different kinds of things I've seen, but I haven't just watched, watched for entertainment. I've watched analytically. Mm. Do you think that there's a lot of power in the media that hasn't even been unlocked yet, that people haven't even clocked onto? Of course, mm. of course. Like, listen, I know that my likability will only get me so far. Mm. There are people with far more engagement and likability that I could help double their following. Yeah. I don't have what they have, the natural likability that they have mm. to get me as far as they've gotten, mm. or it might take me a longer time, or this might not be the country for me. I actually think I would excel much more in the US. I'm just not willing to sell, I'm not willing to, I see going to the US and living there and selling my soul, because I don't think my Christianity will survive there. That's the only reason why I don't want to go there. Are you never, are you saying never? No, or? no, I'll go there to visit. I'll okay. never go there to live. That's what I'm saying. But I actually think the way I am would work much more for a US audience. Okay. Because in a US audience, a niche is bigger. So for instance, I have a niche audience, right? But in the US, a niche audience it's can be a millions of people. Whereas over here, it's hundreds of thousands. Why do you think you're not likable? No, I wouldn't say that I'm not likable. I'm likable by some, but some people have a likability where everybody likes them. Mm -mm. But I could, show, I could show that person how to double their engagement, but they might not listen to me mm -hmm. because they feel like, why would I listen to you? You're beneath me. Do you really 
people think that you're beneath you? Do you think that that's... Oh, no, in, in, in terms of social influence? Yeah. Like, if, if I tell somebody with a million followers I can make it have two, they'd be like, why didn't you do that for yourself? Do you really think that? Ah, sometimes. I talk to these Love Islanders all the time, try to tell them to how to do double it. And yeah, do and do bits and do that, and they don't listen. Do you think sometimes things like blogs pay a, pay a, a part in that? In what? In that ideology that, you know, they're better than other creators. All of social media, I wouldn't even blame blogs. All of social media causes Do you follow that. any blogs? Do you, yeah, do you I follow all of them. I, I, they're how I keep up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly how I keep up with what's going on. Mm. <laughs> Waking up and checking made you think or shade bar is like a ritual for me. <laughs> That's part of my job. Do you want to teach people how to double their engagement? Do you think, do you of see course, yourself? Of course. I, I feel like I'm one of the only few people that be telling people the, the gems and telling people the secret. Mm -hmm. But you can tell, literally, I can tell people the gems all day because that don't mean they're going to follow them. Mm. I've come to learn work ethic ain't everybody. Mm. The tenacity to do this ain't everybody. You got to put your pride aside. You got to put your self-esteem aside in terms of feeling like, oh yeah, I'm so big, I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't try this and I can't do that and worrying about what other people are going to think. By the time you pass through all those hindrances, some people, you could literally give them the lit. I, I've given people the keys to success and watch them not be able to pick up the key and open the door. Let me ask you something. Maybe not in a, in, in a scale, yeah, how much would you say your success is attributed to your natural personality traits by our, or the business side of things. The business side, the mindset, the things that you've taught yourself, you know, being in media, I would actually say it's, um, for me, I would actually say it's 50-50. 50-50 split. Yeah, because if I wasn't able to articulate myself the way I am, mm. I wouldn't, that's my, that, that's one of my UPS, that's one of my UC, USP. Uni, yeah. yeah, that's one of my unique selling points, the way that I'm able to articulate myself. Mm. So if I wasn't able to do it like that, then, applying like i watch people apply business strategies but to ta but to content that is just not engaging mm -mm. and making making your content engaging is a part of your talent definitely yeah. do you feel that as you're going on in your career you're still learning or do you feel like you've reached the point where you're not really taking in much more uh, i'm I, I would say that i would say that i'm still learning mm -hmm. i would never say that i'm not still learning mm -hmm. but where i am in my career right now i'm on cruise control okay so you're just letting letting it happen yeah because I, I because life isn't all about a career for me i also want to be happy i also want to jump on my trampoline i also want to play playstation you and it, it's, ti it's time now oh yeah you feel like it's time yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm i'm not chasing certain levels of richness so what are you chasing happiness happiness, happiness. essentially i'm happy That's if i just make what i make now for the rest of my life you'll be happy i'll be happy That's if, a I make bold statement, if i, if I make half if i make half of what i make now I'll be happy. That's really a bold statement. What is what for everybody who doesn't know exactly what you're doing right now? What are the list of projects that you've got going on right now? Like that's just mad. too many. It's literally. I'll tell you exactly how I make money. Obviously, I'm going into property now, so okay. that will be now how I make residual and passive income. Mm. But how I make money is I continue to get engagement on social media, mm. and then brands holler me. Mm. That's it. Brands holler me, and I get thousands of pounds to promote stuff. How long would you, for somebody who is... I'd say I've been doing this for about five, six years. Five, six years. Yeah. That's not... That's not that long. No, it's not. Yeah. It's really not. Yeah. And you're not that old, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah. And you, you feel like you're going to stop at this point? Yeah, because as I said, it's not... My, my dream was always to do nothing. Mm. That's always been my dream. I, I kind of think it's mad to put your life, put your happiness into your career. Mm. Your career is something you do so you can live. Mm -mm. I want to... People don't know how to live though. That's why they find it an alien concept that I want to quit. Because they don't know how to live. Sometimes when I ask people, what are you doing when you're not doing something? Mm. They're, staring at, they're staring at the wall. Like, like, like me. If you ever watch my Insta stories, you'll see that I know how to have fun. You know not how... like club fun. Like, that's so amateur. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> on the night out on the weekend, oh my God, shocking, like my madness. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a grown man. I'm 30 years old and I just bought a trampoline for my back garden. There's no shame in it. There's no shame in it. But on your Insta stories, it's not just fun. Like, I feel like you talk about a lot of strong and bold situations and yeah. issues and I think that yeah. but I don't see that as work that now is something I'll always do yeah yeah that's not I think work. last year was a big year for that to be honest with you yeah. and I think that it, must it, have been it was George Floyd yeah that changed my life I was never like this before mm. I was never willing to compromise the bag to talk through before George Floyd really yeah but it just it just roused something in me and I was like yeah no more so what actually was a situation at BBC where you actually ended up leaving your radio station because to actually leave and compromise your bag, as yeah. you actually said. Yeah. Um, I would say it's because um, it wasn't because of the N-word being said by a white presenter. It was because 18,000 people complained and they didn't apologise. Okay. And I felt like that's a slap in the cheek 
mm. because the, you, you, you're supposed to do, you're supposed to listen to your audience. Your audience has spoken. It's one of the highest complained about things mm. in the history of the BBC. Did you leave straight away? I left, yeah. I had a conversation with my manager, like, yo, I, I, I want to leave. And then I left. How did that go down? Not well. <laughs> Not well, but they apologised within like 24 hours of me doing that. Do you feel like you achieved what you wanted to achieve? By I, wasn't trying to, I, wasn't trying to achieve, I wasn't trying to achieve anything. I, just, I left just because I said, I said, every corporation in this country is intrinsically racist to me. You cannot be a part of this country and not have a company run by white people that isn't a part of system, systemic racism mm. and isn't like, it's ingrained mm. in everything. Mm. But you can't spit in my face. Yeah. After George Floyd and everything, letting a white presenter say the N word on television, mm. now you're spitting in my mm. face. Yeah. It's scary to leave your. It's scary to leave your job and on such a political issue as well. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? It must have been. Um, you didn't um, know what your next move was. What was you gonna do? To be honest, I, people rate that move a bit too much. At the point, that, at that point, the BBC was the thing that was making me the least money. Oh really? Yeah. So you basically freed up your time to make more money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. It was still yeah. making me money, just the least out of everything I was doing. Out of you was doing. Yeah, yeah. And then you started making more videos on Instagram, I feel, speaking on more issues. Um, especially I, had, I had already started speaking, because George Floyd, mm. the BBC was after that, so I'd already started speaking on mad issues online. Okay. Do you feel now that is part of your brand to speak on these things? I wouldn't say that's a brand thing. If anything, that's ruining my brand, stabbing my brand. <laughs> like, that's, that's like, like ruining, that's like literally. Is it really thing? Um, to, to, you know, it could be. Every time I put a video out there saying my thoughts on certain things, I'm literally rolling the dice. Mm. I can't believe I'm still in this. I can't believe I'm still in the industry. Yeah. So not only do I feel like you make passionate but outlandish statements mm -hmm. about certain topics on your Instagram, I feel like on certain platforms, certain programs, outlandish things have been said to you. And you know what I'm actually talking about is when I watched, <laughs> I watched your podcast with Zizi. Yeah. And she basically said, she wouldn't class you as an alpha male. Yeah, I'm I asking you a question. Yeah, but I don't consider you an alpha male. No, and why is that? Because Ooh, I, just, I, this just, is, I don't consider you an alpha male. Oi, oi. I don't consider you why that. Why am I not an alpha male? Because I just don't get that vibe from you. What's That's an not, alpha male? Well, to me, like, I run my life. That doesn't mean you're an alpha male. I am a businessman. I'm an entrepreneur. An I have employees. That doesn't what make we, you I an run, alpha male. I run. I control my life. But I'm it's talking also, about? yeah, you what's can an control, alpha male? Uh, that's what I mean. What is an alpha male? Just because somebody make that makes sense to me. Just be, what did no, they? What's what, your criteria for alpha well, male? If you'd let me speak, what was that about? Like, that's a, her opinion, isn't it? But why would why would she say that? I'm I'm extremely happy she said that. Why? What do you mean? That was, I think that was a massive moment in culture. I, I ain't stopped hearing about that since. That, and that felt like about a good two months ago now. <laughs> like, what do you think we're trying to do on this podcast? We're trying to make cultural moments. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing think pieces all the way in America where they're referencing our video, mm -hmm. talking about the alpha maleness. Like, I'm glad she said what she said. I'm glad I reacted how I reacted because at the end of the day, we're trying to create social engagement and content. And I think it's a good conversation to be had. Mm -hmm. The conversation the alpha male thing could save a lot of men's lives. But aside from the impact though, what she actually said about you not being an alpha, how do you take that? How does that make you think that people see you? Well, I, I would have pretty much surmised that a lot of people don't see me as an alpha male anyway because of how I portray myself online. But anybody in my real life that knows me knows how my thing's set up. What, what's that like in real life? It's just, it's just I'm a boss, and if you don't, if you know me, you period, know that. Isn't it? Phil, if I'm, and, and, and it doesn't. Re when you're really a boss, and you re like, listen, man, I can't, I can't do this. So I literally, you're, you're, I literally you're live show. in a five bedroom house. Okay, okay. I don't know. What, I don't know what to say. I don't care if they think yeah, I'm yeah. an alpha male or not. Like, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I built this city on rock and roll. Is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I don't it's, know what else to say about that. You know, there are certain things like that you can't really argue with. No, but, but if, no, 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 you can. But what I will say is this. Mm. I'm literally speaking for the men that are going to be the next generation. Okay. The next generation of men that are not going to chase a bunch of stereotypes mm -hmm. because they think that's what girls want. Mm -hmm. I think being a certain way in order for girls to respect you or man to rate you and not being a certain way because it's just the certain way that you want to be is lame. Mm -hmm. There's nothing alpha in that for me. Because man will be like, oh, a man won't respect you, a girl won't respect you. Imagine doing something just for another person's respect. I know, it doesn't I want to do something for my respect. Yeah. I want to rate me. Mm. 
I want to respect me. And, and when, if you find, yeah, you will find that anybody that is strong enough and tough enough to be authentically themselves will always have an audience. Mm. So I may not be an alpha male to you, you may not follow me, but I promise you there are people that, that do. Yeah. And you lot have been around me today and seen people stop me in real life and show me real life love. Yeah, yeah. It's as simple as that, mm. so it's just whatever. How do your friends receive you when you say things like, I'm a boss, you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm the leader in my group, I'm the provider? Like, it's, it's, at, what I'm saying, at my point, it's undeniable. At this point, it's undeniable. And it's not to say that there aren't other leaders in the group. I can be a leader and you can be a leader. Mm -hmm. When it's time to take charge, that's what I'm saying. The, the alpha male thing is dead because everybody everybody has somebody that they go to for guidance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because course. I'm saying in the sense that being an alpha male don't mean that you don't follow nobody mm -hmm. and that you don't take any advice mm -hmm. and that you're a boss in every scenario. Mm -hmm. Do you get what I'm saying? So who do you go to for guidance? Who is who is your I can go I can mentor. go to, I can go to anybody for, I can go to somebody that I consider to know far less than me, mm -hmm. but they might just have a word for me in that moment that might be the encouraging word that I need. Yeah. So I can I can get guidance from anybody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like anybody can preach to me. And how in your relationship, your personal relationships, romantic relationships, do you, would you say you're perceived? Would you say, say you're an alpha male? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm I I'm I am i am not really you can't really mug me, huh? Because I have a weapon that a lot of guys don't have. A lot that? of the, I leave. Okay. They don't have that. If you're policing your girl's attitude and you're and you're like your girl's like you're having to like monitor your girl and watch her over and red blah blah blah, blah you're already you're, if you're having to police her attitude, that means that you're now controlling her from who she actually is. And who she actually is is that person that you know you won't let her be. That's policing. Really and truly, if you were a real man, you'd leave. So you think that that's your advantage, that your advan alpha advantage? How can a girl mug me off if I'm not there? Yeah. If, if, if I'm in a relationship with you and me and you have a discussion about something mm. and we can't, reach, we can't reach a mutual agreement that, that satisfies me and yourself, I'm out. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I can love you and leave. I can love you with all of my... I, my emotions don't control me so much that I can't leave. But where do you and I'd leave any, And I'd leave anybody because I love myself more than I love other people. So if I was with Oprah, if I was with a billionaire woman, <laughs> do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And I only had five pounds to my name. Mm -hmm. If Oprah disrespects me, I'm out. If Oprah disrespects me, and once I bring up the respect, because uh, disrespect, because I'm not saying that I'm not having conversations, mm -hmm. but I'm saying if we're having a conversation about something and then we can't reach mm -hmm. a part in the dialogue where we decide, okay, cool, I get your point, I get your point, and then we'll build from there, I'm out. Mm -hmm. These men can't be out, mm -hmm. so they stay with girls and like, no, nah, why did you do that for and rated? They're getting mad at their girl and that, because their girl isn't what? They wanted they want, her to yeah, be. Yeah. If she's not what you want to be, then go find somebody who is what you want to be instead of trying to police somebody's personality. But then on the flip side, how do you think that you are what somebody wants? Like in, in terms of your career yeah. and... In terms of my career, what? Your career, like obviously you're somebody in the media, yeah. you're on the front line. I'm not going to be what everybody wants. My DMs are ram though, so I don't know. Your DMs are ram? Yeah. You don't respond to DMs? Not anything? really, no. Why? Why don't I respond to DMs? Why, why would I? Why not? I mean, girl, I'm at the be all end all, so why would I? Is, is, is it so crazy that a man would be getting DM'd and not respond to, responding to It's not to that him? crazy, but. There you go. Are you in that place where you're, you don't want to date somebody, you don't want to speak to somebody, or. I mean, I would, I'm, I'm a very precautious person and mm. I'm in control, mm. so I'm not, I'm not just led off by my willy. Mm. Do you get what I'm saying? So it's just like, you have to think about somebody DMing you, what that means and the power dynamic how they might perceive and look at you and what that might make them do. Do you get what I'm saying? Do like, you see women as a distraction? No, I wouldn't. Nah, that's crazy. I wouldn't say I see women as a distraction. No. I would just say that in terms of who I am, I'm protecting my career. So I'm not going to just respond to any and any DM if somebody that I don't know can't verify, don't trust and all of them kinds of things there. Okay, that's yeah, fair yeah, yeah. I think your career now it is quite valuable, isn't it? You see, you see yourself as like, yeah. you, you're a marketer. Yeah. And what does marketing mean to you? Do you think that you're going to potentially expand on the marketing or do you want to slow down it? As Obviously, I said, I'm on cruise control right now. You're on cruise control. Opportunities keep coming to me, so, which I'm thankful for. Amen. But, but if, if something falls in my lap, I might build upon it, but I'm not fighting for anything anymore. Mm. Um, the fight part of my career is over for me, personally. What do you think that you can take from your career long term, like in terms of like building relationships? For example, you've been working with ZZ for a long time. Yeah. Would you say that you guys are genuine friends? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Z Z ZZ is my real friend. That's good. Yeah, That's yeah. And, 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 and I told her from before we even did the podcast with Amazon, I said, never hold back on me. Yeah. That's not what's going to get content here. Mm -hmm. When I thought about our show, I was thinking about everyday struggle with Joe Budden and, and academics. Yes. And I always saw her as the Joe Budden. Flip, um, because number one, the optics of me flipping out at a black woman is not going to work. Mm -hmm. But flip out at me all you want. Mm -hmm. Don't hold back. It's easy. Cost me. 
<laughs> cross me, demasculate me in every way humanly possible. Of course, listen. I don't care about it. Listen, listen, listen. Social media are sheep mm. and they are easy to control. I don't know any other way to say it than that. Do you really believe that? Yeah. What do you, do you feel like you, you, you veer your, con your content in a business way, in, in, in a strategic way, you put out content that you know is going to change this dynamic, make this message? I can literally change how I'm viewed with six videos. Six videos, that's all it takes. Yeah, and, and, and if you do six videos on six different topics, for instance, when I feel like I've been too serious, I just start, I put two or three more funny videos out just to remind them mm, mm. that I still do this comedy thing. Like, when did you purchase apparently, the house? Apparently, um, like a month ago. Like, and, and apparently I'm the first person in my family to have done so. Oh my gosh. Which I, which I didn't even, thank you, which I didn't even that's know. That's really, really good. And, and I'll buy my parents one next. And, and I'm Big looking up. to buy, I'm looking to buy, I'm just looking to keep buying property. Amen. Because I'm making mortgage deposit money every month. So I'm starting to take the money and do that with of it course, now. Of yeah, so that investing in my future. I got, I got to be able to be out of this social media thing if I, if I, if I so feel to drop it tomorrow. Wow. Well, yeah. congratulations because that's incredible. Thank you. And when you first started on this journey, did you set out with the intention you were going to purchase a house? Is this I something mean, that no, you... no, the mission was always just look after my family. Look after your family. I don't, uh, yeah, look after my family. Like, oh. if, if, if all else failed with, with my family right now, everybody could move into my house. Okay. You know what I mean? And, and I, that's powerful. That's beautiful for yeah, me. Yeah, it is. You it know is. what I mean? If, like, I remember when COVID happened, I called my parents and I was like, you know, we're good though, innit? Mm -mm -mm. Something about that banged for me. Mm -mm. Like, like how, how men spend money on Rolexes and watches, like, that's not what does it, does it for me. Being able to call my mom, I'm like, you know, we're good though, innit? Like, you know, yeah. like, we ain't got to worry about no pandemic mm -mm. and that. Uh, we're blessing that, like, like we, we, like, you know what I mean? We're, Being we're able safe. to say, yeah, we're safe. Mm -mm. Being able to say that to my parents, bangs. Yeah. yeah. You've reached, you've reached the, the dream, innit? The accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel that your career, so you've capped your career, like you're not really wanting to do more, but do you think that your career could change? Obviously you're talking about um, property. Do you yeah. think you could see a career long-term in property perhaps? I think that's where I'm going into next. You're going yeah, into yeah, next. Yeah. Bricks and mortar, it's, sim it's, sim it, it's, I'm not saying it's the best investment. I'm saying it's the easiest for me to understand and I'm not trying to do bare work. Right. Yeah. So we're going to see like man development. Yeah, I like, I, like the idea. I like the idea of being a landlord. Really? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just pull up on my tenants, bare man them, just like, yo, is everything good at the yard? All right, cool, safe. <laughs> you can't do that. What's again? No, you can't. What? You have to give your tenants 48 hours. Oh, no, when I say pull up, I don't mean pull up without notice. Yeah. I mean pull up as in <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, okay. I mean the first day when I'm showing them the property. Okay. I right. just want to bear my man them there, just randomly just <laughs> position. Every room in the house, when they open the door, it's one a different one of my man them. But why are you ending your career? So, so like, why? I know you. I don't like, care. I don't care about you. What? Why though? What happiness. I care about happiness. I care about, about living my life. Do you feel that the career that you're currently doing is not providing you with happiness? No, I'm always happy. Mm. I can be happier though. Mm. I can be happier having complete time freedom. And I'm not going to lie, I'm doing horrifyingly little at the moment. Mm. But even then sometimes, some things feel like a chore to me. Mm. So I just like the freedom and the option to do what I want to do. Can basically what you're saying is you feel like the passion is some maybe going from what you're doing. It's not, I never came into this for passion. Mm. I came into this for money to feed my family. Mm. The passion comes when I talk about topics that I really care about. Mm -mm. That I'm not doing for money. That I'm doing that might take money from me. Of course, yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? But like when it comes to my career, mm. I just oh. don't believe life should be lived for a career. Mm -mm -mm. And what's the, one of the biggest lessons that you think you've learned over the past five, six years? What's something for you that without this experience, you would have never learned and you will never be the same again from? Um, you can rather just be yourself. Mm. Um, that's one thing. Number two, money is at the end of ignoring social media comments. <laughs> okay. It really is. Mm. Imagine if I listened. Some, every day I think to myself, imagine if I listened mm. to what? Imagine if I listened to them when they said the Birmingham accent. Mm. Imagine, even, when I, even when I bought the house, people was like, so this is what Waffle can do. They'll hate on you to the end. Mm. So you just gotta, and whether you wanna call it hate or comment, they'll, they'll comment Troll, on you yeah, to the whatever, end. Yeah, whatever yeah. you wanna call it, whether you wanna call it criticism, whatever, they'll do it to the end. You gotta do you, man. Mm -hmm. I always knew it, but it's just reinformed. Mm -hmm. It's reinforced when you really reach the end of the journey and say, flipping now. This is. If you just ignore these people, mm -hmm. look what happens. It's crazy. And I know you said that um, earlier, you felt that if you stayed in Bram, you wouldn't gonna take your career to where it yeah. needed to be. Do you think that there's space for you now to maybe try and help people coming up in Brum or is that something that you would like do it, to do? Do but it all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been doing that consistently the entire time I've had this career. Okay, that's why that's I have insane. a Birmingham price because Birmingham 
doesn't have a social me a, a media hub like London. Yeah. So he doesn't even understand industry prices. If some if I charge industry prices, literally my prices for Birmingham things is like one eighth of the price that I charge in London. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even then they still complain at me and I'm like, bro, you don't even understand. I cut it by massive. I cut it by a massive amount. Yeah. That's so so a Birmingham person can get me for something. And I do a lot of Birmingham things for free. Like so what, what are you doing? Like, like Birmingham artists asking for support, red to tear. Can you show up to this event? Yeah. Can you promote this? Can you put it on the in story? Yeah, I'll yeah, just yeah, do it's it. Big. Yeah, yeah. It's important stuff still because yeah. like a lot of a lot of people wouldn't yeah. do that, especially yeah. if they get I just want my city to have more ambition, that's it. Okay. So so we're here. What's this school? Is this your school? So that's Hajo Girls and then this is Hajo Mixed, which is my school. <laughs> so you went to a mixed school yeah, with a girls' school. Yeah, with a girls' school on top. That's <laughs> mad. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> Your fault. How was it going to school, yeah, with the girls' school next year? Because it's not like it was all boys, yeah, and they then were, it was just. Girls. I don't know. I f there was so much girl in my school. It's like, yeah, we went over there and that, but yeah, it, it didn't feel like we were getting more extra than anybody else because it's what everybody knew. But you had bare girl to choose I'm from. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> was your girlist in school? No, 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 no. Don't lie. No, 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 no. I wasn't. I was. I've never been a girlist. No, Do you really? define a girlist as a guy that gets bare girl or a guy that utilizes the fact that they get bare girl? Both. Everything. Just a like man that loves gal. That's a gal is. No, yeah. then, never. I've, oh, never right. I've never been that's, that kind of brother. I've always been like a romantic brother. Oh, like, yeah, like, I like, I like, you know what I mean? Romance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're Ro deep. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. say, yeah, you want. Is that what you want? <laughs> <laughs> is that what you want? You want a deep, you want a deep hole. Yeah, yeah. Something, something meaningful in it, yeah. Do you feel like you've been like, like that from young? Me, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, because romantic comedies used to be my favourite types of films. And when I used to watch them all the time, I used to always see the guy cheat on the girl mm. and mess it up. And I was like, why is he doing that? But this was before I'd ever had sex. Okay. So I said, I said to myself in my head, whenever, I, whenever that kind of thing comes into my life, I won't let it control me the way I see it control other men. I hear you. And I've, I've tried to maintain that. What other things do you feel like from young, even at school, that you've seen that shaped some of your solid... Things. This school shaped everything about me because mm. all, my, all my school was was violence. Violence? Yeah, yeah, so just like verbal and physical violence. All we did was slander each other, like <laughs> dissing each other. Like now, I remember one time I was in a lesson, but it's like a three hour lesson. You know, like when it's like lessons doubled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then like, literally I was getting dissed the whole lesson. And obviously we get dissed all the time. Yeah, yeah. But this was just a different level of consistent, consistent man going in on me. And I went in the toilet and cried for a bit. Like yeah, I, I went to the toilet. And oh, I, shit. I went to the toilet and I just let, oh, a, I just let a little cry David. out and then I came back. And then I came back but I didn't dry my eyes properly. So then man clapped that I was crying. That's when they went in a man properly, bro. <laughs> but yeah, 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 yeah. Do you feel like you had a good, like, what, like friendships in school? Do you feel like yeah, it was yeah, I'm still, miss? I'm still friends with all of them now. And I just, I just think this school built, man, for toughness, like, yeah, yeah. in every single way. Like, when I say, when I say violence, like, it weren't too much stabbing, shooting or anything like that beans. in my school. Just fighting all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, right now, I only have seven knuckles. Uh, so if you notice that knuckle, that knuckle's like a regular knuckle. Look at that one. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, yeah. I broke my knuckle on my brethren's forehead. What the hell? Yeah, yeah. and that's because one day, every, they used to have days when they, we, we rushed each other and it was like my day. But I was like, lads, I'm not really feeling it today because I've had a lot going on and that. And they was like, <laughs> I need a break from the rushing. But they, so they was like, all right, cool. But then one of my friends was like, nah. So I was like, if, it, if you're doing it on your own, that's not a rush, that's a fight. Yeah. And I punched him, but I punched him in his forehead. I obviously aimed incorrectly and punched him in his forehead and I lost my knuckle. That's fine. So the, the knuckle's just broken on the inside now. That mm. is actually And it, people won't know, it, people don't usually notice, but I've got bare scars. Is so this from like school? Some of the scars are from school and some of the scars are from Jamaica. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What was school, what school so like they, out there? Violence the, as well? The, the most of my scars from Jamaica is, is from one incident. So obviously, Basically, what had happened was I stole somebody's weed. Let me explain what happened. <laughs> I, w I ran into, I ran into like a, a weed field, but I didn't know what it was. Okay. And I was with my brethren, mm. and we started taking it up. And then the guys chased us. And then obviously, in the in my neighborhood, we've got my church, and by my church is like a large barbed wire fence, like probably double the size of this. Yeah. But it was night, so I can't see. So I ran into the fence, and I got my face stuck on the fence, and I had to pull my face. Half oh, of the bar, half shit. the bar, bar been. So, so I've got a couple scars on my face from oh, that. Yeah, shit, yeah. man, you're scarred up from school. But then from and then from school, just just fighting all the time. That's mad. But at least you still got friends from school. Yeah, yeah. You no, because that's what I'm saying. If, like we had a lot of fights. We had a lot of fights with other schools as well. But our fighting, as aggressive as it was, was over. Was all we're all still friends. 
But why do you think you lot was fighting though? I don't know. That's just what, that was our, literally, that was our idea. Well, so literally, we would come to school and it'd be like, white sucks versus black sucks. Luck versus, so our school had two parts, which are oh my days, if this was a, this was the meaning of Bloods versus Crips. <laughs> so, Brid was blue and Luck was red, okay. I believe, yeah. And literally it was Blood versus Crips. So if you was from Brit, like, if you was in Brid, right, you had beef with Luck man from year seven to year 11. <laughs> but what happened was is, in year nine, I left Brid and went to Luck. So you changed lanes. So I so lines. I switched camp. You're an op. <laughs> when I went from Brid to Luck, Luck didn't accept me, and Brid saw me as ops. There was times I'm getting rushed by everybody in the corridor, <laughs> all at the up. same time. Yeah, so yeah. That's it's actually mad. fucked up. Though. Yeah. yeah. So, so where are we right now? Like, where right. is this? Where we are right now is like a park in Brumford, which is the ends that I grew up in. Um, I used to live in tower blocks behind us but they're, they're, they're down now it used to be called holbrook tower oh they're not live down. On the, yeah i used to live on the 25th floor but <laughs> this is this is we call this track uh because there used to be like a race track here before mm. um but listen like obviously people when they're talking about their journeys in the past they always talk about the struggles in it mm. but for me i don't like to just do that like man was happy mm. you get what i'm saying even with all of the struggles poverty all of them different things like man had jokes here. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. bring all the girls here. We're all chilling all the man them. You see man get robbed here. Even that's still struggle. But you, <laughs> you man have little disputes and fights yeah, here. Yeah. Play football here. Play basketball here. Like this was just where man would come to chill. We'd be all thirty deep at this park mm. and stuff like that. Just so why do you think that men don't like you? Like you just seem like cool. Like people don't understand that you're just yeah. But I mean, you're meeting me in real life. Real life experience with somebody's different. I never Most get negative energy from people in, in real, real life. life. Obviously, online now you might just be getting me commenting or replying back to or responding to something that's been said online, and then it's all inflammatory content all mm. the time. Mm. Do you get what I'm saying? So you're getting that tidbit of me, but you don't know me as a full person. No, of but I, same way, I don't know them as a full person. They mm. might have like I, I with a lot of people online. Maybe that maybe who they are on live is literally just a hyped up version of who they are because people will hype up, people will add source for engagement. Mm. So they, they, they might have a problem with you to a factor of two, but they know that a factor of two comment won't get them engagement. So yeah, now they've got to add hot source to it and say something really <laughs> cruel that's so to get up. level 10 engagement, to get the pinned comment, to get the likes, to get the replies. How so, do you feel about them trolls that say things like that? Does it, does it ever affect your mental health, like coming here chasing yeah. nostalgia? I Come wouldn't. on, man. There I must would, be a time. I wouldn't say that. Affect mental health is strong because, like, as I said, I think mentally is where I'm a titan. Mm -hmm. I'll never hype physical strength. I'll never hype any other strength. But where it comes to mentally, you feel I strong. feel like, like, literally, like, I can't, I cannot physically or mentally let myself be, bo be bothered or, you know, downtrodden. By, by people when I know where I came from. I came from nada mm -mm. and now I feed my family, now yeah. I look after my friends, mm -mm. now it's I look big. after myself. So I'm gonna let a social media comment from somebody bother me. I know you say it like that, but it's hard when it's, this is your craft, this is who you are yeah. and you put your time and effort in. Nah, I see that I, don't, but I've, I was never in love with it to that extent. I was okay. never in love with my craft to the extent where somebody being disrespectful towards it would hurt me. You don't see it as an extension the things of yourself. That, the things that I love in life mm. is my friendships and my family. Amen. And I know what they think of me. You know what I mean? I know, I know they know my character. I know they know when the camera comes up, mm. I'll, still talk and I'll still talk about black women when I won't get likes and comments yeah, when yeah. we're just around each other. That's I'll important. still talk about the fact that we as men need to work on certain things. I'll still talk about all the. I'll still talk about my issues with race in this country and stuff yeah. like that. When the cameras are off, when I can't get no clout from it, mm -hmm. they know who this is who I am. They That's they know that they they know that when I was living in London and coming back to Birmingham every Sunday, no one seeing that. Mm -hmm. Do you get what I'm saying? It's for your own. Coming back to Birmingham every Sunday for church, they they not they don't see that. This yeah. is real life now. Mm -hmm. Do you get what I'm saying? So, if you had a message here for any man out there, a black man, white man, whoever a man who's struggling with his mental health or, or, or confidence or even feeling doubtful, what would you say? I'd ask them to really look inside themselves and ask themselves how much of their problems are based on how people perceive them. Mm -hmm. And then ask themselves how important that is. Okay. I think that's a, yeah. I think that's a good way to Because we as men, we chase importance in it. Mm. We, chase, we chase that validation. We chase validity within the social construct. Mm -hmm. But why? Why, if it, don't, if, if, why don't if it don't make you happy? True that. You know what I'm Especially if like it's it's almost like rating yourself by a barometer that's that's also damaged. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Why would you care about society's rating of you when society's messed up? They can't rate you good anyway because they don't have the capacity to. It's a good question. Yeah.